So we looked at this morning at Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verses 10 through 20. Uh, to have the message to be strong in the Lord, the power of His might, put on the whole arm, armor of God to stand against the wiles of the devil. And if you glance down after verse 20, uh, especially if you have a, have a heading there, it may just, or even as you go through, you see, oh, he's going to mention somebody's name, and then he's just kind of wrapping things up. And, and so, uh, you know, kind of as an obligation, I'll finish reading those verses, but really we've finished the most important part of, of, the, of the letter. And whether that's true or not, read with me verses 21 and 22. Paul says, But that you may also know by my affairs and how I am doing, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. I mentioned this morning that, that Paul was in prison writing from, from Rome. Uh, and, and so as is natural, uh, they, the Ephesians were uh, interested in, in his condition. Uh, if maybe if he needed anything, uh, others had sent aid to him. The Philippians did that. And so they were interested in an update. And that maybe that was, uh, that was among the reasons that he's writing to them. But instead of giving all that detail, he puts this letter into the hand of Tychicus in Rome. Tych- Tychicus travels to Ephesians and also to Colossae. And if you read those two books, you'll notice the similarity. And especially at the end of those books, you'll see some of the same names. Tychicus appears at the end of Colossians as well. So instead of giving a report, he sends the report by mouth through Tychicus, as well as this letter and the, and the teachings that we've studied. But as he briefly commends Tychicus to them, uh, by what he says, he also commends Tychicus to us as an example uh, that we can think about and learn from. And so I want to look at six words that Paul used about Tychicus. Four of them are here. Uh, the others are in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 7. Probably in my lesson tonight, I'll say the word Tychicus more times than I have in my lifetime combined. But uh, hopefully we'll see the, the, the few, though the details of him are few, uh, that they provide some, some very simple things uh, for us to reflect on. First thing that we come across in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 21, is he refers... It's at the end of the chart. Pardon me. Is that he refers to Tychicus as beloved or, or beloved. Uh, you can see in that, in this word, the word love, and this is that kind of love that we're most familiar with, most typical in the Bible, that uh, agape kind of love that is selfless, that is self-sacrificial. And so when Paul thought of Tychicus, uh, the love that he had for him came to mind. This, this is the, exactly the same word when Jesus was baptized at the Mount of Tr- Transfiguration. The voice came from heaven on both those occasions and said, this is my beloved son. So this, this carries all of that same meaning. So what was it about Tychicus that caused Paul, uh, when he thought of him, to, to think of him this way? And on the chart here, I think there's two simple reasons. It's because of who he was, and it's because of what he did. Now, who he was to Paul was a brother. Uh, here was someone else that was in Christ, uh, equally, Paul was an apostle, all that we know about Paul, uh, but they, they were equals in Christ, simply brothers, the, the simplest of titles, if brother is, is even, qualifies even as a title. Uh, that means they, they, sh- they share the meaning of that, they share the, the knowledge of what that means. Uh, but, but it wasn't just, well, here's somebody I'm, I'm by, by spiritual blood that I'm related to. It was also because of what Paul knew that Tychicus did that he was someone whom Paul loved. Uh, we, we get very few details about, uh, about what Tychicus did, but Paul calls him later, or, or here, a brother, but he calls him a minister. He calls him a servant over in Colossians chapter 4. And then in Acts chapter 20, uh, in verse 4, Tychicus is also mentioned. He's in a group who are traveling to deliver aid to the to needy saints in Jerusalem. And so he was a messenger in that sense. So Paul knew far more details than, than are recorded about this man, but when Paul thought about him and thought about what he did, then here's someone whom Paul loved. 
And so the application is, is quite simple for that. Who, who views me that way? Who views you that way when they think of your name, when they see your face? Then one of the words they come is, this is, this is someone uh, that, that I love in a way that is this agape kind of love. <clears throat> one way to think about the value of, of someone loving us in that simplest but most important of ways is think to the time when you have felt most alone. And that, that comes and goes at different times in our lives. But the, the value of someone loving us uh, is maybe most, under, most well understood by us in those moments because God has provided a way that we, we don't ever have to be alone. We, we may not have anybody with us, but on those occasions where we, we feel abandoned in some way, can we think of others who know us and who love us, and that may not feel like emotionally that pulls us out of the pit, but it, it gives us something to hold on to. And of course, we know the love of God for us always, but then it, just in a different way, I hope, I think it helps in some of those difficult times to know if I know there is someone who thinks of me and would call me beloved. Well, why would they do that? Why would someone love me? Not because I'm sinless, not because I'm perfect, not because I'm even equally likable all of the time. In part, this kind of love is not on the basis of somebody's performance. It's, it's on the basis of who I am, who you are. Just because I am a brother, just because you are a sister, then there are people who know you and love you. But then it does include, at least in part, what we do. Uh, and so that, that's worth dwelling on. I'm not going to go through a long list because it would be different for all of us. But what, what in my conduct, not even exceptionally, but what is consistently a part of my conduct, and that I, not that I do it in front of anyone for them to see, but just because the nature of it, it, it happens in front of people, and publicly or privately, but what are the things that in my conduct uh, would, would cause someone to, to think of me and to think of what I do, and to say, that's, that's someone I appreciate. I appreciate deeply. That's someone who is beloved. That's, that's how Paul thought of Tychicus. Uh, and Tychicus not being anybody uh, in the sight of God, any, any different than anybody in this room, we can be beloved. Second, and he calls him brother, we're going to touch on that later, but... Uh, he also calls him faithful. He calls him a faithful minister in the Lord. We're going to talk about minister later. But I just want to take each of these words on their own. When Paul thought of Tychicus, he thought, here's somebody who is faithful in the Lord. Of course, the, the key word of faithful, boil that down, is faith. And so when we think about what faith is, well, it's, it's what we believe. It may be regardless of how we've learned it. It may be something we... We know by every avenue of our senses, that's, that's why we believe it. It may be something that we trust. So because we know something else, then there may be something we don't fully know, but we trust it. We have, have a, a strong assurance of it. So that, that's the nature of faith. And so that's the nature of faithful. That means somebody who can be believed, who can be trusted, and so that's what Paul thought of when he thought of Tychicus. Here is someone who, who Paul says is faithful. Well, why would he say that about Tychicus? Had Tychicus never sinned? Well, of course, Tychicus had sinned. Paul had sinned. But, but he was in Christ. And so Paul knew his sins had for, been forgiven. And Paul had been able to observe the life of Tychicus enough that he could say, not only is this someone who belongs to Christ, here's someone who lives that, here is someone who is faithful in the Lord. Again, even though our, the examples are few, I think there's enough to help us at least appreciate that a little bit. Uh, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 4, I mentioned that a moment ago, Tychicus, the name, of Tych, the name Tychicus appears along several other names. There was a group of some Christians from Asia and from other areas taking funds to, to uh, Jerusalem to the saints who are in need. And so Paul was in that group, and Tychicus was in that group. So my point is, Paul had seen Tychicus handle money. 
And that, that's one of the things that often is a, a test of character for people, isn't it? Can, could you trust them with your wallet? And they, you give them your wallet and walk away and come back and you don't even have to open it up to see if the same amount is there. You, you, you totally trust they're faithful in that way. Well, Paul had seen Tychicus faithful in that way. If, if you've ever traveled with a group of people, you may even realize that, that sometimes uh, traveling, we're supposed to be on the same schedule, but we're not all ready to leave at the same time. And, well, where's, where's Jim? Well, he's wandered. He's in a shop somewhere holding everybody up. Uh, traveling with people can be more of a test than we might think on the surface. So in Acts chapter 20, verse 4, you've, you've got this group of men who are delivering these funds. So Paul had traveled with Tychicus, and he had learned enough about him on that occasion through, uh, through all the miles and all the things that, that occurred during that travel. Uh, here's someone he could travel with. Here's someone he could trust. Paul had worshipped with Tychicus. In Acts chapter 20, verse maybe we refer to often, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Remember Paul was in Troas. Well, again, if you go back up, back up to verse 4, Tychicus was in that group. He was also in Troas. And so here's one specific occasion, and there almost certainly would have been others, but when Paul worshipped with Tychicus, number one, Tychicus was there. But then by whatever... Uh, whatever Paul could notice about Tychicus as they worship together, he could say, here is someone faithful in the Lord. It was clear to Paul uh, from everything that he could see that the Lord was the reason for what Tychicus did. Uh, the Lord w was, the, uh, was the source of how Tychicus did, the things that he did, and why he did them. Uh, everything that was external... When Paul saw Tychicus, what he thought is, here's someone faithful in the Lord. Turn to Matthew chapter 5, <clears throat> verses 13 through 16. All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, regardless of how recent or how far in the past. All have sinned. And so nobody is, in the absolute sense, faithful. All we can do is judge fruit. So somebody can, from all appearances... Everything can seem to be fine and well, and things can be different that we can't, can't observe. But in Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16, Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's, that's what Paul says of him. And so think about, think about us just as Paul, uh, Paul saw glimpses, snippets of the life of Tychicus. He saw him in that group and then there was a time where maybe he wasn't with him and then uh, uh, saw him on some other occasion and then there was a gap between that. Well, likewise, there are people who observe segments of, of my life and segments of your life. Nobody, even our spouse, sees it 24-7. Everybody sees these little snippets. Uh, our family, those who are in our home, they, they usually see the biggest and in some ways the most real side of us. But then there are people who they just see the work side. They only see us during those business hours or, or at school. There are those who only see us for that that two and a half minutes that we spend in the checkout line, that, that's all they see of us while we run our errands, while we are fulfilling some project or some, uh, some recreation. They, they only see us at the basketball court, and so that, that's the only part of us that maybe they know well. Maybe, they, maybe they're people who only see us when we gather for worship or, or in a Bible class. We can't spend every day, all day, together, and so, for different reasons, we, we know even in a, a church of this size, and then the larger church grows, the more difficult it is to have the same kind of connection to the same degree with every person. And so, we, even in a, in a legitimate way, uh, some people can, can on, may only know us from our time here. So, think about Matthew 5, 13 through 16, and, and all of those different segments and, 
and snippets of our life that people see, what, what's the word that they see? Whether they see us two and a half minutes, two and a half hours, twelve and a half hours a day, faithful in the Lord. Is, is that what would come to mind? Based on what they see and what we do and why we do it and how we do it. Uh, not everybody has enough to know to tie all of that to the Lord, but some can. And we have something to do with what opportunities they have to know what we do and why we do it and how we do it and whether all of that is connected to the Lord. So faithful was one of the words Paul used of Tychicus. I wonder what my neighbor and my family and my co-workers, what, what would be in their top six words of me. Next, and this one is, is only in Colossians chapter 4. Uh, again, there Paul is making some closing statements uh, very similar to those that he makes in Ephesians chapter 6. But he calls Tychicus a fellow, not, not in the sense of he's a jolly good fellow, but, but in the sense of a partner, he calls him a fellow servant. So we're going to talk about the servant aspect, but I want to talk about the fellow part. Uh, what this emphasizes is that Tychicus was someone who shared in the work with others. Tychicus was not the kind that says, I've got to do all the work. If it's going to get done right, I've got to be the one to do it. Tychicus was not the kind that, well, I, somebody, somebody will pick it up. Somebody will do it. And that somebody never ended up being him. Tychicus was a fellow. He was someone who shared in the work. It, it wasn't a competition. And he wasn't just a, a total independent spirit. There's a right degree of independence of sort, but that... That can be out of balance. And so this, this one word, by calling him a fellow, that, that says something about Tychicus, that he worked with others. When we work with others, there, there has to be some degree of agreement. We don't have to be alike in every way. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, Paul talked about those who we would be yoked to. And often this passage is just very briefly referred to, and then an immediate application is made. Well, this is talking about marriage. Well, Paul doesn't say anything specifically about marriage. Uh, I don't think that's a good application of this passage. But it's saying don't join with someone if, if you're joining in them in some sin. And so don't, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. If that yoke is going to, if, is going to drag you into sin with them, then don't put that yoke on. I guess that could be applied if I don't have any right to be married to that person. Well, then that, that would be an unequal yoke. But, but in general, uh, the, the application, if you read the following verses, I'm not trying to dig into the verse, but the, the application is much, much more broad than that. Because the, the point is, if you put that yoke on, whatever the nature of the relationship, there's something you have in common with them. So be careful what that is. Amos chapter 3, verse 3. Can, can two walk together? Can two walk together? Lest they be uh, united. Or share in common. I'm not, not quoting that exactly. But he's, he's pointing to that. If you're walking together, you, you're going in the right direction. There's got to be some reason that you're traveling in that direction. And so in spiritual things, what about Paul and Tychicus? What, what is it that made them fellows? It would be, just to stay within Ephesians 4, since we've been looking at that, uh, it would be they, they, sh they both had the yoke of one body and one spirit and one Lord and one hope and one, one Father. All of those things, that, that caused them to be able to share that yoke. But, of course, being yoked together with someone for one purpose doesn't mean everything else that we, that we think and feel and follow is absolutely the same or even the same to the same degree right uh, there of all the billions of people on this earth there are that many opinions on a variety of subject uh, a variety of subjects and then no matter how many things those two people agree on the fact is every single one of us are changing every single day today changes us in some way whether it's by something new 
or by reinforcing something old. But that, that changes us. It deepens us and moves us more in one direction or more in a different direction. And so there, there are people change, and even if they're changing in the same way, well, usually they're changing at different speeds, maturing at different speeds. And so that can affect the work together. And then, in, in addition to how they change, uh, just to borrow the language of Ecclesiastes 3, the seasons of life. So two people are united, and they're committed to working together, and, and they, they, they both put on the whole armor of God. But one person, it's the time to be born in his family. The other one, it's the time to die. The, the one, it's time to build up. And the other one, it's time to tear down. Well, that, that affects their walk together in some way. It doesn't have to destroy it, but it, it affects it to some degree. And so there, there are a series of, of reasons why it can be difficult and why there will be an ongoing challenge for two people to be fellows. And so for Paul to say of Tychicus, Paul wasn't married. Was, was Tychicus married? I, I don't know if that was something they had in common or if that would have made Tychicus and Paul more difficult for them to work together. If it made it more difficult, they, they found a way to work together in that. So much so that Paul would say, this is a fellow with me. Tychicus was, was a Gentile. He's mentioned as being from Asia in Acts chapter 20. Well, of course, that's the opposite of Paul. He was a Jew of Jews. Uh, he was, was, uh, lived in Israel. And so they, they could have sat down and parsed out all of their differences. And yet after they, they had a lengthy list of differences of background and preferences and opinions, at the end of the day, Paul could say, this is someone that I am a fellow with. And so how many applications could we, could we think of today? How long a list could we make today of every person here and if we listed three things about our background, how many people here would have all three of those things in common? I guess it's possible. I would, would say it's unlikely. And so there, there's always going to be a challenge in being a fellow with others. Now, some fellows are going to be easier to work with than others uh, because, because we're, we're in family. We, we, we share that part. So we know each other well and we're like in those ways or childhood friends uh, or just other people because they are so much like us, then it's easy to be a fellow with them. And that for those things to come naturally and easy, and easy that, that offers a unique relationship. But turn to Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Uh, that, that's, again, that's, that's helpful and good for us to have those easy relationships but I'm also convinced that God is looking to see well, who here is willing to be a fellow with someone that I don't share all those background or family or activities or personality, just don't share all those things. And so that relationship, it, it takes more effort to be a fellow with them because we just, we just don't always find ourselves shopping at the same place and bumping into each other. And, and oh, I, was, I saw that same, same show this weekend. There's some people we were never talking about or thinking about the same. How, how can I be a fellow with them? Galatians 3, 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So God's looking to see if my difference is with another brother or sister are so stark as male and female, are so different as Jew and Greek, are so different as slave and free, what, what effort do I make to be a fellow with them? Romans 14 would even add one more challenge to that, where Romans 14 talks about the weak and the strong, not, not the believer and the unbeliever, and not, not the right and the wrong, but someone who is weak in the faith and strong in the faith. The context, by him mentioning the foods and days, he's talking about things that are matters of opinion. But we, we all know matters of opinion can even make, uh, make it a little bit, di little bit difficult to be fellows. And so Romans 14 is, is written to say, figure out a way, find a way, to if you're strong, to be a fellow with the weak. And, and if you're weak... 
then find a way to be a fellow with those who are strong. Uh, how much of that applied to Paul and Tychicus? Is I, I don't I don't know, but but the Jew and Gentile certainly did. And so it says something of uh, of Paul of Tychicus that Paul would say of him, uh, he is a fellow fellow servant. Now let's get into the the other half of these three phrases that I've looked at. Paul said that he was beloved, and he attached to that uh, a brother, a beloved brother, but now I don't want to focus as much on the beloved, but more on the brother. Paul said he was a brother. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I think we, we all catch the meaning of that. Why does he call him brother? Well, because they, they share a common father. They are, are co-members, equal members of the household of God, Paul writes, up, writes of here. Now therefore, you, no long, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So Tychicus was carrying the letter uh, that, that said, that used this exact phrase. That's why Paul called him a fellow brother, or excuse me, a beloved brother, because they shared a common father. Right. And then how does that happen, that they share a common father? Well, not just in the sense that they were made in the image of God, of course, but what, what made Paul a child of God so that he would be a brother of Tychicus? Well, then that goes back to the beginning of the faith of, of Paul. What do you know about Saul of Tarsus? And when did he go from being a child of the devil to a child of the Father? That's in Acts chapter 9, uh, Acts chapter 22, when Ananias came to him. He had spent three days praying. Well, let me back up. He had called Jesus Lord on the road to Damascus. That implies some faith. He had spent three days praying. That implies some repentance. He had even confessed that faith by addressing Jesus as Lord. And so Ananias comes to him and says, Now, why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Well, that's when Paul, go, Paul becomes a child of God. So then, what makes he and Tychicus brothers? Well, we don't, we don't have the, the same detail of when Tychicus heard and learned and accepted and all those things. He might be included in Acts chapter 19 and verse 10 because he was from Asia. And when, when Paul was in Ephesus, so we're studying the letter to the Ephesians, when Paul was in Ephesus, that was the time when the word went out to all of Asia. Acts chapter 19, verse 10. So that, that could very possibly be the time when Tychicus uh, heard the gospel and became a Christian. And maybe that's where their, their bond and their work began. But the point is that if we that because they were both children, then of course that's the nature of the relationship that made them brothers. So why would Paul call him a brother? Well, that's simply because of who who God viewed Tychicus as being. So Paul had to, to call Tychicus a brother. Paul had to first look at himself and say, Am I a child? And some people are mistaken about that. But to the best of his knowledge, Paul had to say, I'm a child, and the best everything I know about Tychicus, he's a child. And since we have a common father, then that, that makes me a brother. That pr pretty much that simple, isn't it? So who am I? And who, who is my brother? Who is my sister? Well, from time to time, that means I step back and say, well, uh, who am I a child of? And I, I can answer that question, of course, best for myself. And then to the best of my knowledge of what I know about this individual, uh, can, can I be reasonably sure that they are a child of God? And if those things match, then, then we have a brother. Turn to, to Romans chapter 12. But it, it, it should go beyond. That's, that's the basis and the foundation. There is a relationship. There's an automatic relationship. Uh, if... If we share a common father, in Romans chapter 12 then, and in verse 10, uh, there, there is a, a Greek word, and I don't have any formal Greek training, but we all know it because there's a city named after that uh, in, in Pennsylvania, the city of Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a, the Greek word for brotherly. It's known as the city of brotherly love, and that's what that, that's what that word means. 
Well, in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, we have, uh, we, we have the word Philadelphia, where he writes, Be kindly affectionate to one another with Philadelphia, with brotherly love. And so it's, it should be instinctive in us, the nature of, of the love that a sibling shares for the other. And especially that it emphasizes kindness, not, not rivalry, uh, but, but kindness, the kindness of siblings. And so in Romans chapter 12, you find those who, with whom you share that spiritual bond, and kindness needs to be expressed. Again, in the flesh, maybe that, that develops over time. And so also in the spirit, it's, it's something that, that sometimes, for different reasons, has to be learned that I, I learn to love them like family, and sometimes we'll find it may even exceed family. We have the same word, so I won't turn and read it in Second Peter 1, but that's that passage, you remember, add to your faith, virtue, and knowledge, and self-control. But the last two things in that, in that text are add brotherly kindness, and then love. So brotherly kindness is, not, is different from that selfless, self-sacrificial, agape kind of love. Uh, that, that agape kind of love is, is for friend, for stranger, for enemy. Same love for all of them, at least the basis of it. Brotherly kindness isn't like that. Uh, brotherly kindness is not something that God commands us to have for all people everywhere. Uh, brotherly kindness is, is reserved for someone that I know. And brotherly kindness is reserved for someone who is close to me, near to me, dear to me. And so all of that is, is packaged in this. When Paul says, this is my brother, uh, then this is someone known to Paul, near to Paul, dear to Paul, and someone who, uh, who Paul would find ways to express kindness and that he no doubt had seen the same from, from Tychicus towards him. And so we're, we're urged in these passages to think of our physical family and learn from that and then express that same tenderness and kindness to all who are my family in the Lord, to all who are who is my brother or my, my sister. Next, back in Ephesians 6, verse 21, he calls him a, a faithful minister, faithful minister in the Lord. So I just want to emphasize minister. This one involves a little bit of a word study because this word minister is used in a, a whole host of different ways. In Matthew 26 and verse 20, Jesus said, If any wants to be great among you, let him be your servant or your, your minister. And so that, that would apply to anyone, to everyone who, who genuinely uh, belongs to Christ. Look over at Ephesians chapter 12. Often, often minister, maybe in our culture, in our society, you might most often hear that, well, that, that must mean someone who's a preacher of some kind or of some sort. And we'll see in a minute, it, it can have that meaning, uh, but that's, that's not the most, most common in the New Testament. And here, I think is this passage will help us see that quickest, the quickest and simplest. Verse 11 is the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And verse 12, here's what they're supposed to be doing. He says, they're given for the equipping of the saints. And what are they equipping the saints for? For the work of ministry. The apostles, prophets, all these workers are to help make the saints ministers. So that's where that, that's not that specific kind of a minister a preacher or whatever word someone might use. This is just a very general helping and teaching and showing the saints here's what it means to be a, a minister, someone ministering, someone serving in that way. So this word minister can just be general in that sense. Uh, it can also be very specific. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1, the, it's usually translated in, as a different word for some reason. But it might be helpful for us to know it's, it's the same word, uh, deacon. So Paul wrote Philippians 1.1 to the elders and deacons. But that word deacon is, 
is the same as Ephesians 4.12. All the saints are to be trained for the work of ministry. So that's why I say this is a word that context just indicates. Well, is it a general minister that everybody is to be? Or is it a specific kind of minister that not everybody can be? Because 1 Timothy chapter 3 gives the, uh, the traits of someone who is going to be this kind of a minister. Or deacon is the word common in English. But it, it has another general meaning. In 2 Corinthians 11.15, Satan has ministers. So maybe that really helps us to grasp what, what it really means. It's someone who chooses to serve. Serve Christ or serving the church in, in a very specific way, or even serving Satan. It can be used in that way. And, and then in Colossians 1, verse 25, Paul used that of the work that he was doing, that, that God made him a minister. And, and whether that means mainly his work as an apostle, or just his work as someone spreading the gospel, I, I, I don't know immediately, but just give you, uh, just do this, quick overview and word study to admit I don't know exactly what Paul meant when he was calling Tychicus a minister did he mean he had just like all of the saints taken on the mindset of being willing to serve or is it possible Tychicus was a was a deacon somewhere could be uh, he certainly was not a minister of, of Satan but he could have also been a minister someone spreading the word in, in that way I, I just I don't really know. Maybe you can help me. Um, but I, I don't know how to nail it down specifically. But the point is, in whatever way he served, Paul said he is a faithful minister. While, while we can't nail that down specifically, um, I do want to go back and, and, and notice, just repeat what I've said, that, uh, that Tychicus has been mentioned as a messenger. And in fact, every single time, if you've got a concordance, and if you went and read every passage, there's, there's uh, I think, four times where Tychicus is mentioned. But I think this is significant in, to some degree in, in filling out what it means that he was a minister. Every time you read about Tychicus, he is going or coming. He is being sent by someone and he's going to someone, it, but it's never for his own benefit. In Acts 20 verse 4, he's delivering funds from Asia to Jerusalem. He isn't taking funds from himself for others. He's not going somewhere to get funds for himself. He's doing this on the behalf of some, on behalf of others. And here in Ephesians and in Colossians, he's delivering a letter. But it, it's not a love note. And so he, he's not taking it to his love far away. He would be self-motivated. He's delivering a letter for Paul, who's in prison, who can't take it. And he's delivering it to the brethren in Ephesus and Colossae who, who desperately wanted to know the condition of Paul. And then in 2 Timothy 4, verse 12, it's the same. Paul says, I have sent Tychicus to Ephesus when he was urging Timothy to come before winter. So, again, we, we don't have all the details, but as a rule, every time you read about Tychicus, he is going or coming on behalf, uh, going to someone, from someone, literally traveling hundreds of miles, literally traveling, traveling days, if not weeks, if, if not months, and it's never out of self-interest. So I don't know exactly what kind of minister he was, but I know he was, was that kind of a minister. Turn to Romans chapter 12. What... What kind of a minister would someone say of, of you and of me? Paul knew Tychicus well enough to say that. What does someone know well enough of you or of me in order to say that? Well, we, we probably don't do the, uh, can't match the same kind of miles that Tychicus had in, in doing the work of a messenger. But that's, that's okay. We don't have to and unless we have to, unless... We have the opportunity, unless we have the ability. But Romans 12, beginning in verse 6, says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. That's obviously a little more 
uh, related to what we're looking at, but he goes on, he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Uh, I find this verse interesting that he's, he's talking about gifts while the majority of what he says here is expected of every single person here. Prophecy aside, to some degree we're all to, to minister, to teach, whether it's public or private, to exhort, to give, to show mercy. I don't think anybody of us, any of us would say, well, that's not my gift, so I don't have to do that. <laughs> but then there's a degree where he's saying, well, there are some people that, while God expects that to some degree of everyone, there's some of us, He expects in some specific area more of you than He does of others. And not in the sense that He's measuring us against each other, what he's saying is there's some things that are specific about you that God expects more of. So just, just to go back to Tychicus, he did all this traveling. Well, did, did maybe that meant he wasn't married. And so he was free to do that where others might not have been. Or maybe his wife was able to travel with him. Or, or, or I, I don't know. But he, I think it's safe to say he had the gift of being a, a traveling minister in that sense. There was something about his life and his ability that he could go and he could do all those things without neglecting some responsibility. Well, but you, you may not be able to handle that same kind of a schedule or a workload. And again, you don't have to. But is it in the area of, of giving? Is it in the area of, of mercy? Are, are you just surrounded by people and circumstances where you... Your mercy is, is needed maybe more than, than you might think it is from others uh, or, or exhortation. So, again, there's some things that are expected of all, and I, I can't define this for you. It's, it's a challenge for any of us uh, maybe to even uh, fully grasp what is expected of us. But the point is there's, there are some things that in order to be faithful, I can't just say I do it sometimes, there's some things that, that that has to be, in a way, kind of a, a stamp of who I am. And I, I need to, to focus on that and look for and use opportunities. Not in the sense because I'm better than anyone else, but just because I have opportunities that others don't have. In that sense of what he here calls a gift. I won't turn and read it, but 1 Peter 4 uses the same kind of language. of If you have a gift, then, then minister it. If any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. That's the part of that verse most often quoted. But then he goes on to mention other kinds of things, somewhat as basic as what we read here in Romans chapter 12. So how, what's that area for me? What's that area for you? I don't know. And how many minutes a day, how many hours a week does God expect us to be spending in? I don't know. I can't answer that for you. I, I, I need to be able to answer it for myself to, to some degree and then continue to watch and consider that at the end of the day, I'm either a faithful minister in those ways, or I'm not. There's, there's no in-between. I'm either a faithful minister or an unfaithful minister. Think about this, this word minister in all of its meanings, and find the one and find the area for you, and then this week focus on being a someone that God would call, and maybe even someone else would know you well enough to know of your reputation as a faithful minister. And then one more. This comes from Colossians chapter 4 and verse 7, but it's also said of Tychicus that he is, he is called a fellow servant. Uh, I don't know that there's a major distinction between minister and servant. It's a, it's a different word but there would be some similarities. But we find this word servant, for example, in the, in the parables of Jesus. This is that word that he often used. Six books in the New Testament. Uh, the, the one who is writing describes himself sometimes as an apostle or sometimes in some other ways, but six times introduces himself, I am a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is one of the signature expectations of Jesus in Matthew 10, 26 and 27. If anyone desires to follow after, to be great, let him be your servant. 
This is what Jesus said about His mission. The Son of Man has come not to be served, but to serve. Sometimes this word is even translated slave. Um, but Jesus came to serve, whatever the meaning. The, the verse Bob read this morning from Philippians 2. Jesus came in the form of a servant. That's this word. So that's the word that Paul chose of Tychicus. That says something about him, doesn't it? Uh, we, we could just review everything else we've talked about. His travel, his, his willingness to go on behalf of others. Suffice it to say, Paul viewed him as a servant. And this is one of those expectations that God has of, of you and of me. Turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse 26 of all the words that God uses to describe those who are His. Disciple, Christian, saint. All those words that are, are beneficial and helpful. We, let's be sure saint is, or excuse me, that servant is in our mind as one of those. Jesus said, If anyone serves Me, let him follow Me, and where I am there My servant will be also. If anyone serves Me, him My Father will will honor. And so Tychicus was first a servant of Christ. First a servant of Christ. That, uh, who, who am I? We think of our last name or other relationships. Uh, as we grow, first we need to think of ourselves, I am a servant of Christ. When we think about Paul, he was first a servant of Christ, and that meant that he was spreading the gospel to the lost. He was building that same message up in the saints. He, uh, on several occasions, is known to have been spreading the gospel, uh, uh, relieving saints who were in need, delivering and helping to find uh, the funds that would meet the needs of his people. And so Paul was a servant of Christ, and in his teaching and his work, he urged, urged churches to serve Christ. He urged families to serve Christ. And He urged individual saints to serve Christ. And in one sense, well, they're all supposed to serve, but then isn't there some difference between how an individual serves and what a family is to do? And some difference in what the church is to do as a, as a servant of Christ and what a family is to do. There, there's some distinctions in that. Uh, could, could just reference in 1 Timothy 5.16, Paul says that if any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged. So the church to be a servant in that case is actually in some circumstances to refrain from financially relieving even Christians, some Christian widows. And Paul gives the details of that back in verse 9. So a church could actually not serve Christ if they are giving their money to some who God hasn't, uh, God has 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 not authorized it for, so we we have to do more than paint with a broad brush. We ought to be a servant of Christ. This is just just do good things, and so every, we should just all be doing good things. Well, but what are the good things for the church? What are the good things for the family? And then what are some of the good things that those can't do that I just need to take upon myself? from Him to do. So think of ourselves as a servant. That's how Paul thought of Tychicus. And then last, I want us to think briefly about serving with other servants. Because Paul, Paul called him my fellow servant. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9 is that familiar passage. Two is better than one. Think about that in the context of a fellow servant. It's good to be a servant of Christ. Make no exception, but two servants of Christ, in a sense, are better than one. Think about Paul. How, how often do you read about Paul going somewhere all by himself? There, there might be a case, aside from occasions where he was arrested, I, I can't think of any. Paul was always a servant of Christ, but working with others. Timothy, Tychicus, Barnabas, Silas, and, and others. That was the nature of his work. Uh, there, there is joy in being a servant of Christ. That, that's true. If we have to do it alone, we'll, we'll do it alone. But for just a moment, think about two is better than one. How serving Christ with another servant 
enhances the joy that we have. Can, can you think of examples uh, in your life that quickly come to mind that are like that? I think sitting in this room is one. We, if, if there was just one, then maybe we'd come here if we needed to. But isn't it better that there are two? And maybe a little bit better if there's three, and slightly incrementally better if there's four? We're not interested first in numbers any more than Solomon was when he said two is better than one. Not because there's a crowd, but if there are two that are walking and working together. Think about that in your, in your summer plans, the, the state fair. I uh, don't have those dates off the top of my head. But if, if only one person could be at the booth, that's something. And we all share in that to some degree. But if, if two can work there together, if three can work there together, the joy and in some ways maybe the effectiveness is enhanced when we are fellow servants. But I don't just mean in that kind of work, in your home. We, we could all go in our family in different directions doing different good things. And sometimes we have to do that. But sometimes isn't the joy enhanced when, when we all pile in and we're all going to the same place at the same time to do the same thing together. Husbands and wives parents and children think about the joy of serving Christ and think about how that is enhanced when we do it together that was how Paul thought of the work he had the opportunity to do with Tychicus and so in the eyes of God and in the eyes of man let's gain the reputation of being a servant and of being a fellow servant Tychicus uh, if we gave some other thought too is think of to this, think of how much encouragement Paul received from this man whose name just appears here and there without much detail. But he was of great encouragement to Paul, so much so that that's who Paul sent to Ephesus, and that's who Paul sent to Colossae. What, what this week is going to contribute and, and to help and to cause growth in you as a brother, as a minister, as a servant faithful, and a fellow, and beloved in these areas. Let's set our plans, let's set our schedules, whether it's the work we're all doing together, or privately from house to house, and maybe one of these words, two of these words, maybe all six of these words might characterize my life and your life. I hope you can learn something from this man, Tychicus. As we sing this song, think about something we learn of him, and if you find your life is different from that, then you need help from the same source and the same Savior that He did. He was a brother. If, if you are not a child of that same God, would you confess your faith and come with repentance into the water and be baptized? Christ will keep His promise. If you haven't kept your promise to Him, if you'll bring those sins back to Him, He'll keep His promise again and help and encourage and strengthen you. And we're here to do the same if in any way that we can. If nothing else, let's sing. And because we're in Christ with that joy and with that hope. But if we could help in any way specifically, tell us how as we stand and sing.